This is the sound of turning ideas into software. This is the sound of engineering and passion. Work. Work more. Work harder. Experiment. Build. Break. And build again. Write code. Improve it. Job done. Celebrate. Insurance. Finance. Retail. Defense. Robotics. Energy. Amethyx. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. This is uh, Francesco podcasting from the regular office of Amethyx Technologies based in uh, Brussels City, Belgium. Today I want to speak about generative AI and um, not necessarily and specifically about large language models, but about the fact that generative AI and large language models are in fact slowing down, (laughs) if you didn't realize. Um, And the person I'm going to mention quite a lot in this episode today is going to be Gary Marcus, who's kind of my guru now. In fact, he has been my guru for a long time now, because he's probably one of those few people who are actually, uh, you know, telling the truth about AI, in my personal opinion, and uh, also trying to spread the fact that um, generative AI and large language models in particular Uh, will not lead to artificial general intelligence or AGI, as uh, many people uh, refer to. And uh, some of those, for example, Ben Gertzel, who's actually one of the guys who actually invented the name AGI, artificial general intelligence, among many other things that made much less sense than that. Even Ben Gertzel is showing signs of reason now. And uh, there has been recently um, a conference, AGI24, I think beginning of uh, or mid-August, if I'm not wrong, in which, of course, organized by Ben Gertzel. Ben Gertzel was there. Gary Marcus was there, was invited. He gave an amazing keynote. Uh, and uh, and then there were some comments about Ben, um, you know, about Gary's participation to the uh, to the conference, uh, and even Ben Gertzel is saying, large language models, and I'm quoting, are not going to be grown into AGIs. They are not going to be the central components of AGI architectures. And he continues, the rate of fundamental improvement of large language models appear to be slowing down, though there are more bells and whistles and integrations, etc., to be added. There is a very nice um, tweet. I, I still call it Twitter, but, you know, I should educate myself too. We changed name. God damn, it's called X. Anyway, so Ben uh, published a very interesting uh, tweet on X. Well, we can get the best of both worlds, in which he, um, you know, drew some conclusion about um, large language models and generative AI. Now, I, uh, from what I understand from from what he what he writes, uh, is that he's more into neural symbolic um, type of computation, um, which is you know kind of technology or things that, you know, concepts that come from the 70s, uh, neural symbolic artificial intelligence, you know, and, and he was kind of the, the person who some years ago was saying a lot of different things from about deep learning, for example. But anyway, I don't, I'm, I'm not here to judge. I'm just here to state facts and uh, just recall what people wrote or keep writing. Um, So he said, well, um, I am pretty confident that in my OpenCog Hyperion Hyperion project, he has always these fancy names about whatever he does, and associated cognitive systems theory, we have the core ideas needed to get to neural symbolic evolutionary HLAGI, now he coined a new thing, within years, not decades. Okay, he keeps going, you know, marketizing the next probably big bullshit that is going to go on the news in a few months or years, uh, probably. Anyway, what I want to say here is that um, some of those supporters of deep learning, of large language model, of um, uh, of generative um, AI and artificial general intelligence are in fact now kind of retreating or reconsidering their positions. Uh, Now, as a matter of fact, generative AI itself will not disappear. We all know that. It's a very interesting technology for what it does. Um, It's just that, you know, people have been pushing it a bit too much, in in our opinion. Uh, And Gary Marcus has been one of those, you know, paladins of, uh, you know, putting down uh, the enthusiasm uh, in a wise way and saying, hey guys, 
generative AI can be cool, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting tech, but uh -huh, it's not going to lead us to AGI. And guess what? Even investors um, are actually slowing down in that sense. They have been throwing literally billions of dollars to, to this new tech and, you know, to the dreams that uh, people like Sam Altman have been selling so far. And uh, now they are thinking, hmm, maybe it's, uh, you know, it's time to get our money back. And uh, you know what? You will not get the money back. And you know why? Because they spent it, they burned that money into, well, first of all, personnel, but also infrastructure and GPU compute. So this is a very, very expensive technology. Uh, and uh, many investors are realizing now uh, that um, probably there will be no return or very little returns on the on the investment they made. Um, for sure, there is no business that uh, can claim they are making a lot of money with uh, uh, with large language models, except for OpenAI. But they are not actually making money; they are raising money. Uh, they are actually burning money um, because it doesn't mean does, doesn't seem to be a sustainable business. You know, it's a very expensive business, and not only that, OpenAI has been immediately attacked by a, a bunch of of um, you know competitors. Even those like Meta, for example, are giving the same stuff for free now. Um, so, you know, there is a lot has happened since one year and a half when we all started speaking about uh, large language models. Uh, another sign that we are approaching a slowdown is probably the drop of um, uh, the stock, the NVIDIA stock in, uh, in August. That was first a 6% and then a 20% over the last month. And I'm just talking about um, you know, August 2024. And um, so these are kind of signs that, you know, I'm not an analyst, but definitely I, you know, look at these signs and see, and, you know, try to correlate things with the, the expectations that always also go down with respect to a particular technology. And also the fact that, for example, NVIDIA has been the uh, technological supporter of uh, of large language models. Without NVIDIA and without uh, NVIDIA's technology, we would have not have uh, any large language model, uh, as well as any deep learning, probably the way we have them today. Now, of course, we have to say, and you know, we have to be fair in this analysis that many, many stocks were down. There is kind of a, uh, you know, a drop of IT and several corrections in the world of IT. But uh, again, NVIDIA was probably one of the hardest hit um, in this month. Uh, so, you know, it's it's interesting to keep an eye on that. Now, don't take this as, uh, you know, financial advice. Uh, I'm not an analyst. I'm not advising you to short your NVIDIA stock, but um, I'm just, you know, try, trying to be critical about what's going on in the in the tech world, especially when it comes to correlated technologies, uh, expectations, and of course, the companies that support and sell, uh, you know, whatever is the induced market of those technologies. And NVIDIA is, of course, one of them. Now, um, there has been an initial, um, literally, uh, money flooding <laughs> with the VC money has been flooding the, the space of uh, artificial, um, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence, and in particular, large language models and generative AI. Um, and now everything is kind, kind of going into a correction. Uh, the first doubts are, start, are starting grazing. And um, if I can conclude something about this phenomenon is that, well, we didn't learn anything from the past. Uh, we have seen this a number of times in IT. We have seen this with blockchain. We have seen this with Web3. Um, again, there was like the, the same patterns. You know, people who throw money without even knowing what they're doing, uh, you know, just getting excited about some claims by some guys and uh, um, all of a sudden you know after less than a year or a year uh, they start uh, you know renegotiating their positions and uh, trying to you know short their stocks and uh, or sell them completely um now there are uh, as i said many many signs about this slowdown and uh, gary marcus is probably the best person in the world who can 
um, write and speak about that. There are many readings by Gary uh, online. I will report some of those, the most prominent ones for sure, uh, on the in the show notes of this episode at datascienceatom.com, um, providing some of the best links that I've been reading by Gary Marcus, though his website is an absolute uh, gold mine when it comes to you know reading and having a a, a really opinionated um, conclusion about what's going on in the world of AI. So another reason is the fact that OpenAI is um, let's say diversifying their shop uh, in the sense that they are ser- they are ser- they're using um, you know the same technology to provide multiple services. For example, uh, code completion, copywriting. Uh, document analysis uh, instead of you know focusing on the core uh, business of uh, uh, of GPT or as I say of uh, artificial general intelligence which by the way they will never reach at least not with this technology not with GPT so as Gary says and uh, again he summarizes this uh, very very nicely he says OpenAI could wind up being seen as the we work of AI <laughs> which is definitely a very interesting conclusion we have seen what happened to we work and that we've seen uh we should you know by analogy see what's gonna happen to open ai also there's been uh, quite a few people leaving open ai after uh, mr altman was um, hired back or he came back or whatever happened in that uh, in that period that we know of uh, there is even an episode on this uh, show so feel free to search and uh uh, listen to that again or, or just listen for the first time and probably you would like to share with a few thumbs up that's always appreciated by the way for the very first time arctic wolf the industry leader in managed security operations is offering you access to the most forward-thinking ideas from their most knowledgeable experts discover the top 2024 predictions developed by arctic wolf labs their team of elite security researchers, data scientists, and security engineers. Derived from the intelligence and insights gained from trillions of weekly observations within thousands of unique environments, these predictions trace the development of several trends based on their earlier, simpler iterations and anticipate which ones are poised to take significant steps forward in the coming months. Learn what the new year holds for ransomware as a service, Active Directory, Artificial Intelligence, and more when you download the 2024 Arctic Wolf Labs Predictions Report today at arcticwolf.com forward slash data science. That's arcticwolf.com forward slash data science. But you will also find the link in the show notes of this episode at datascienceathome.com. Speaking about OpenAI, um, they are losing money, you know, they are not really building a business that is sustainable. Um, this company is currently valued at something like $80 billion, and um, there isn't been any GPT-5, there hasn't been any major improvement since GPT-4. Um, there has been, what, there has been even more competitors in the field, um, starting from, um, of course, uh, Meta, and then there's been... Uh, Anthropic, uh, Google, um, even Microsoft, they are cutting deals with competitors. So, you know, these are really bad signs of what's going on in that world. Um, the stuff of OpenAI costs a lot of money. Uh, they have a lot of operating costs, uh, you know, just to, you know, keep the, keep the gears turning. They need a lot of cash. Um, and the margins that, uh, of course, um, they have on, you know, on the service of GPT, for example, uh, are smaller and smaller. Because guess what? There are more competitors. There will be, for sure, a price war, as we are already seeing it, um, obviously. And it's going to be very hard to compete with Meta, giving away similar technology for absolute free. Now... Of course, we know that Meta never gives anything for free. Um, as you know, Facebook dodge it, as uh, they say. And so I don't believe in this free lunch, of course, or free products. Uh, and uh, I will spend a few words in a minute. Actually, I will spend a few words now because the only, um, in my opinion, this is a very personal opinion, what is left for OpenAI now uh, is becoming a surveillance company, in fact. Um, so there's no other, in my opinion, there's no other way that OpenAI could, in fact, compete 
in this market as it is now, as it is evolving uh, now. So becoming a surveillance company is probably one of the best. Uh, and even though it's a very cynical conclusion, it's still from a from a business perspective, it's probably one of the best moves that OpenAI can do at this point in time, which is extremely scary. It's, it's really bad, uh, but it is what it is. Now, uh, let's speak about some facts. Um, the first thing is that uh, Sam Altman has acknowledged that he wants to train on everyone's personal documents. Think about emails, uh, Word files, Excel sheets, your personal files, whatever is text is readable from your machine, uh, he wants to learn from there. He wants to train uh, large language models and in particular his model, his, his closed AI model, <laughs> which is indeed a GPT or chat GPT. Um, another thing that um, is that ChatGPT has gathered an humongous amount of personal data. Um, and as you can see, and I will spend a few words later, um, you know, all the chats that you have with ChatGPT, you know, they are never deleted to start with. They become kind of property of OpenAI. And on those conversations that you think are, you know, lost into space, uh, well, they can train their models on and they can analyze whatever you type at GPT and uh, your conversations, your whatever you share on that damn uh, input text, uh, text box and, uh, and, uh, and web browser. We also have to uh, remember that Sam Altman founded WorldCoin. Uh, so this guy is really is really used to, um, you know, uh, how can I say, be have this kind of invasive attitude with respect to data and people. I mean, after all, WorldCoin is an eye scanning corporation uh, that indeed they want to build a product that scans your eyeball and uh, and uh, archives that information in private databases, which is freaking scary uh, if you think. Now, this is the same guy who's bringing you chat GPT in your pocket, right? So just put things in perspective. Uh, and if you want one more, OpenAI recently put certain Paul Nakasone uh, on the board. Now you would say, who the hell is Paul Nakasone? Well, he's an ex-NSA. So, you know, these are all elements that made us believe that probably OpenAI is becoming kind of a the sneaky actor in the world, um, a bit more than or a lot more than uh, Facebook itself. So as a conclusion, Sam Altman definitely wants to monetize, train and know everything about you. And when I say everything about you, um, I'm not exaggerating because, you know, you have to be honest and uh, I'm going to make a list of the things of the, the top things that people use ChatGPT for. And probably I'm actually very sure that on, on large numbers, you personally, whoever is listening now, you would be doing at least 90% of what I'm saying. So you would be using ChatGPT at least 90% of the time for the things that I'm going to tell you now. So do you use ChatGPT for learning and education? For example, asking to clarify concepts. You know, people ask for detailed explanations of scientific, historical or technical topics. Come on. Or learning new skills when you don't want to read that much and you ask for summarizing a concept that otherwise you have to read. Uh, too many pages on Wikipedia or whatever, right? So these are the type of things that we can, let's say, classify under learning and education. So if you use ChatGPT for these things, well, this means that ChatGPT knows what are the concepts you need the clarification for. Writing assistance. Come on, this is the thing that everybody on the planet does. Everybody who's using ChatGPT is using ChatGPT for writing assistance, especially people who are not really keen with English or with their own language and they want to write, for example, legalist English or formal English or business English. And English is just one of the many languages that ChatGPT can uh, generate, of course. So creative writing, content creation, 
Does it resonate with someone here? <laughs> uh, resume and cover letter writing, for example, these are all things that, remember, ChatGPT knows about you. When you ask for writing assistance to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT is giving you writing assistance on that, on, on whatever you ask for, they memorize that you needed writing assistance for blah, blah content, right? Casual conversations and entertainment. This is another category that I uh, realize people use ChatGPT for. These are, this is usually the category that, um, you know, kind of forces people to reveal their inner side or their secret or personal thoughts. Because, you know, when you have like a small talk or jokes and humor or, or games and challenges, or just you know, casual conversations with uh, uh, with ChatGPT. You are actually speaking about very personal things, probably things that happened in your family. This happened. My dad did that. My mom said that. And what should I do? What would you do if you were in my place? Blah blah blah. Right. So in this way, ChatGPT again is learning the personal aspects of your of yourself that not even Facebook had access to, if you think. So imagine how powerful, you know, in what a privileged position ChatGPT is as we speak. And it can go on with personal advice and guidance. It's another category. Relationship advice. How many people listening to this show are speaking to ChatGPT about relationship advice or life advice or mental health and well-being? Only among my friends, of course, I will not make names, there is at least three out of 10 people who ask ChatGPT about these things. Um, now, of course, it's not professional help help that they are, they are asking, but users sometimes discuss stress, anxiety, or ask for tips or on self-care. And again, remember, ChatGPT knows about this, knows that you might have a personal problem in might ha might know that or might infer that you need personal advice and and there is no you know deep tech that is required for doing that there is just a chat you are doing it <laughs> you are bringing this information you are saving and giving this information away on the uh, chat gpt website and then of course there is technical support troubleshooting uh, productivity tools um, coding help that there's one of the biggest one for tech technical people which again means that ChatGPT knows your weaknesses uh, in your um, you know technical preparation and so they can build a very interesting and very detailed profile about your yourself then of course there is we can go on eh? uh, curiosity and the exploration general knowledge uh, exploring ideas um, or if you have the next let's say, project in your head that you would like some advice on. And the first person, quote unquote person, you're going to uh, let them know <laughs> it's probably going to be ChatGPT because guess what? There, There's no time to talk to your friends or you don't have people who are technically capable of helping you uh, in that particular sector. And so you ask ChatGPT. And again, they are storing these conversations and at the same time, they are building very likely a profile about you, not to mention shopping and recommendations, product recommendations, service recommendations, comparisons, uh, like users ask for comparisons between different products, services, options to make informed decisions. And again, these are all elements that allow a, an algorithm to easily, really easily uh, complete a profile very, very detail in a very detailed fashion. So it's clear that while large language models have the potential to learn and become more helpful in the future, uh, there's a fine line between innovation and surveillance. And if companies like OpenAI aren't careful, and let me add that they don't seem to be interested in being careful, to be honest. Now, the data we share could be used in ways we don't fully control. And this will blur the boundaries between assistance and intrusion. It's very, it's a very blurred line there, uh, because the answer from a person like Sam Altman would, will be not would be, but will be, yes. But we provide assistance to our user because we care of them. You know, that's the same bullshit that Mark Zuckerberg was telling us 20 years ago. 
Now there is a new guy that is telling you the same things, but is even more subtle than Mark Zuckerberg 20 years ago, because guess what? ChatGPT is a proactive tool, is a tool that you go to and release your conversations and, engage, and, and uh, initiate your conversations. Now, of course, the challenge lies in uh, balancing technological progress with uh, ethical responsibility. And when I speak about ethical responsibility, I don't mean that we should expect ethical responsibility from the same actors who are building these tools. That will never ever happen. It never did. It means that someone has to regulate these things. Pay attention. I'm not saying to regulate the technology. That would be the most stupid thing that people would be thinking of, especially in Europe. Many European regulators are thinking of pulling the brakes on, on the technology. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they should be regulating the companies, the corporations that use such technologies, but not the technology per se. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'll talk with you next time.